Have you noticed that we all need heroes? Who are some of your heroes? Now this is interactive church, remember? <laughs> We're allowed to talk to one another now and then. So when we ask, who is a New Zealand hero, who would you identify? John? Oh, okay. A runner. That's good. Who else? Edmund Hillary climbed, I know that one, <laughs> climbed Mount Everest. Who else? <laughs> Say again? Oh, Richie McCall. Yeah, he's been a hero to many young people coming through. And uh, set a pretty good standard too, in most ways. Peter Blake. Peter Blake. Yeah, the sailor. Uh, done so well, hasn't he? Who else? Rutherford. Yeah, he was an atomic scientist. Yeah. We don't go there in New Zealand, you know. Yeah. We don't even believe in atoms here, let alone anything else. Um, but no, he was one of the fathers of the atomic theory. Um, a very, very clever man. Anybody else? David Lawley. David Lani, I've heard David's name mentioned both in positive terms and as a curse word. Uh, so it depends on which side you are, you know, as to whether David is a, a hero or a villain. But you know what? All of us need heroes. People who we admire because of their achievements or their noble qualities and for their courage. Um, real human beings with flaws and failures just like anyone else. They're not perfect. These soaring eagles inspire us to do better while realizing that we, like them, may crash and burn from time to time. But the challenge is for us to get up and get going again. I'm sure all of us at some stage in our life has looked at the mess that our world is in and, and thought, I wish I could change the world. I wish I could just change this aspect of it. And you know what, that's an unselfish part of our nature that is God-given, I believe. And we celebrated today the, the Siddiqui family, who we were able to uh, pay finances towards freeing uh, from slavery. You see, that's part of who God has made us to be. And yet, so often we want to do more. There's a comment I love, and it goes like this, it says... Be the change you wish to see in the world. Be the change you wish to see in the world. You want to see more love? Be the change. You want to see more honesty? Be the change. You see, we need to understand that it's not up to somebody else. It's up to each one of us to be those heroes. To be those men and women who others look to and say, wow, look what they've achieved, look what they've done. Everyone has the power to make an impact, either for good or evil. And it's up to us to challenge ourselves to make a difference. But the, cha the difficulty is that meaningful or effective change isn't always instant or on a large scale. So sometimes it's easy for us to become discouraged. Reminds me of a little boy walking along the, the seashore and a whole lot of, of uh, uh, a starfish had been washed up by a tide. And as he walked along, he picked up a starfish and threw it back into the water. Walked a couple of more paces, picked up another starfish and threw it into the water. Eventually an old fella came over to him and said, Boy, you will never make a difference for these starfish. The little boy walked another step, picked up a starfish, picked it up and threw it into the water. And he said, well, I made a difference for that one. <laughs> you know what? Too often we're looking at how many starfish are out there instead of looking at the ways that we can engage to make a difference in the world we live in. We are so committed to criticizing and to running down things that aren't going the way we think they should without making the difference that we can make in our lives. Have you ever asked yourself, how can I make a difference? Listen to this poem by Edwin 
Oscar Grover, he says, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. You see, that's what makes a hero. is somebody who looks at what can be done rather than becoming obsessed with what can't be done. Somebody who is prepared to look at the big picture and put first things first. To make a difference in the world through doing what they can do for the benefit of others. Over the past weeks, we've discussed the qualities of those who soar like eagles and have used them in opposition to those who are mediocre and scratch with turkeys. And over the past weeks, we've had a look at essential characteristics for making an impact in our world. And the first one we said was we need to be people of vision, that we need the ability to see above and beyond the majority, to be unaffected by statistics. To be unintimidated by the odds. To be unmoved by obstacles like so-called impossibilities and restrictions and difficulties. Seeing the greatness of God above all. We said that's what separates an eagle from a turkey. The second quality was people with determination. Deciding to stay at it when the results don't come immediately. It's hanging in there, not giving up, not lessening one's convictions because the road is difficult. Thirdly, we said they were people with clear priorities. They knew what was important and they kept the first thing first. They kept the kingdom of God and His righteousness as their guiding light through the world that we live in. And as we look at that, Jesus said, if you love me, You'll keep my commandments. And you know what? We're simply saying this. If we would put the priority of the kingdom first in our lives, then everything else falls into place. Because when we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, we fulfill all the law and the prophets. You see, that's when we begin to rise up and be the men and women that God is looking for. Fourthly, and this is the one we want to spend some time on today, they are people who are accountable. It's opening our life to a, a few selected, trusted, loyal confidence who speak the truth and who have the right to examine, to question, to evaluate and to give me wise counsel. And you know what, in our world it's not popular. We're, we're so independent these days. We are so caught up with the fact that I am my own boss. And you know what? There's a rebellion in that that is ungodly. I want us this morning to consider a memorable story of accountability. And um, it's found in 2 Samuel 12. So if you have your Bibles with you, go with me there. And we're going to read together from verses 1 to 14. It's a story with two major characters. A guy called Nathan, who is a prophet. And secondly, a guy who is David, who was one of the most powerful kings of his day. So we have Nathan and we have David. So let's read together in 2 Samuel 12. It says, so the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David the story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guests. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Isn't it interesting how we can be so self-righteous when we think it's somebody else? 
that's the wrong thing. They should never have done that. How could they do that? And yet we're doing the very same things, but not being caught. David was furious. You are the man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says, because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give you wives to, your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for your sins. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. There is so much in that story I don't have time to unpack today. But I want us, you to see that we are accountable for our actions. And for our attitudes towards the Word of God. And that God holds us accountable. Not simply on the day of judgment, but often He will send men and women across our paths who will call us to account using the Word of God as their foundation. The other thing I wanted to just note here is that there is always a consequence for sin. You know, it was interesting to me that, that, that even though David genuinely repented and God forgave him, his son still died. And sometimes we think that when we come to God and say, God, I'm sorry, that God not only takes away the sin, but that He removes the consequences. And that's not always the case. In fact, as, as we look at the story, the greatest uh, sin that there was, wasn't killing Uriah the Hittite, or even adultery with, with Bathsheba, but the utter despising or utter contempt that David showed towards God's word. And you know what? When we're getting to the place where we're doing what we think is right and going our way, what we are doing is we're showing utter contempt for God's word. And we can come and repent of that. We can ask for forgiveness. But you know what? Sometimes there are long-term consequences for that. That God doesn't set aside. Like alcoholics who have drunk themselves into a stupor for years, they realize their sin, they come to God, they find forgiveness, and God forgives them 100%. But you know what? Their liver is still damaged by the abuse of alcohol. There's still a consequence, a physical consequence that needs to be faced. And we need to understand that, I think, because too often I feel like we take repentance too lightly. And we take sin too lightly. We're not that concerned about it, but I want you to understand that every sin has a consequence. And they are not always set aside because we seek forgiveness. Was David's forgiveness, I mean, uh, repentance uh, uh, heartfelt? If you go with me to Psalm 51, it says here, and this is the psalm he wrote after this incident. He writes, verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. When I was reading that during the week, I, I, I just... Pray, God, allow my sin to haunt me. Do never allow the wrong things that I do just to be of no importance. A 
against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. For I was a born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He goes on in verse 10 and he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. You see, allowing God to hold him accountable for his actions through the prophet Nathan, David's life and reign were spared. And he proved himself to be genuinely a man after God's own heart. But you see, accountability is essential for long-term success. And we find that again and again through the scripture. But before we get there, let's have a look at four essential qualities for accountability. And the simple question we ask ourselves is, can you stand the heat? Because you know what? Accountability is tough. And it's sometimes like going into a furnace. And the heat is the acrostic for honest. Are you committed to the truth regardless of how much it hurts you? A willingness to admit the truth no matter how difficult or humiliating the admission may be. Hating all that is phony or false. You see, if I'm going to live accountable, I've got to be honest. I've got to be honest. Secondly, I need to be exposed. I need to be capable of being wounded. I need to allow people to look at my life and to evaluate the way I live so that they can bring it alongside the Word of God so they can check me out and see whether I'm on the narrow path or the broad path that leads to destruction. So I need to be exposed. I need to be available. I need to be approachable. I need to be touchable. I I need to be able to be interrupted. I need to make time so that people can come and talk to me and let me know when I have messed up and when I need correction. Fourthly, I need to be teachable. I need to learn a willingness to learn, being quick to hear and respond to reproof. Being open to counsel. If we're going to be accountable, we've got to be able to stand the heat. We've got to learn to be honest, exposed, available, and teachable. But a c- couple of quick principles, and today's a little more teaching than uh, preaching. Next week we'll do the preaching. But some important principles is accountability deals with your blind spots. You know what? One of the problems we have is we all see ourselves as being pretty perfect. No, we don't. But you know, the reality is we're blind to some of the biggest flaws in our characters. And it's only people outside of us who can see them. One of the things that I learned, which I found really interesting, is when you look into the area of mental health, do you know that somebody who is going through clinical depression cannot see that they're in clinical depression? Everybody else around them can see that they are negative and they're down, they're demotivated, they're not eating, they're not sleeping, they're not... All the symptoms are there for everybody to see, but for the individual who's going through. Now, wouldn't it be neat to have somebody courageous enough in the early stages to come alongside and say, hey, you know, I'm really concerned about you because I think you're in a downward spot. And they be me. But you see, accountability deals with the blind spots. Sometimes I don't see the things that I'm doing or understand the impact that what I'm doing has on other people. Sometimes it takes a totally separate person, outside of even my wife or my family, to see what's really going on. And I need to have the humility to have some trusted friends who I allow into my life to speak to me about the hard stuff. 
who will tell me the truth because they love me. You know what I find a, a sad is that we often hear the truth from those who hate us before we hear it from the ones who love us. We hear people who despise us or, or think we're weird or think we're really off the wall telling us the truth before we tell people who say they care about us and love us. Telling us what we need. Accountability is so important in the Christian life. Thirdly, too much independence can be dangerous. You know what the problem with the whole uh, book of Judges is? Do you know what the underlying principle of the problems that it, uh, um, uh, influenced uh, Israel were? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And you know what? When I have too much independence... I do what I think is right, but I have nobody checking me to make sure that the decisions I'm making or the things that I'm working on or the direction I'm going on is right. And we've said it so often, a one degree uh, difference on the compass over a thousand kilometers makes a huge difference in your destination. And, and so what we need to understand is we can be independent but we need to have people who are guarding us and watching over us and keeping us safe. Let's have a look at a couple of scriptural principles on accountability. The first one, and the three that we're going to look at, is accountability to God is inescapable and inevitable. What do we mean by that? Matthew 12, 36, Jesus says, But I tell you the truth, for every careless word that people speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. So there's a day coming when, when we will have personalized, individualized accountability before God. Where it'll be Him and us. Where I have to give an account for the way that I've lived my life. For the, the Bible says in the King James, the deeds done in the body, the things that I've done while I'm alive. I'm going to have to give an account to God for every one of those things. If you go to Romans 14 verse 12, it says it. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Because we're Christians, because we're forgiven, because we have uh, laid behind us the sins of our past, does not mean that we escape judgment. The Bible tells us that we will all appear before the judgment seat, either of Jesus or of God. Now, if I appear before the judgment seat, the beamer seat, the mercy seat of Jesus Christ, I am saved, I am a Christian, I am home for eternity. And that's exciting, but there's still a judgment that takes place there. One of my friends said many years ago, it's like, he said, I, I wonder if it's going to be like God plays on the big screen of heaven everything that we've done in our lives. It'd be a bit scary there, wouldn't it? You know, anything you didn't confess gets played on the big screen. Man, I tell you what, I confess every day. I even make up things to confess about just to make sure I didn't miss anything. But you see, that's the whole principle, isn't it? That we will give an account. The Bible says that what we do will either be hay straw or stubble or grass. And you know what? For many of us, doing good things with bad attitudes means that we get no reward. It doesn't mean that we lose out on heaven, but it means we get no reward for what we've done. But if we were serving God with the right attitudes, then we receive rewards of gold, silver, and precious stones, which are not consumed in the fire. You see, every one of us will stand before God and give an account. We need to understand that. It's inexcusable. There's no way around it. We, and so we need in this life those who will hold us accountable to the principles of God's Word so that we can stand before Him with heads held high, knowing that we've resolved the issues that need to be resolved. That's what you and I are here for. You know what? If we didn't need each other, God would never have put into place something called the church. But the church was His idea, not our idea. And why do we need each other? We need each other to hold each other accountable and responsible. So that when we stand in the presence of God, God, 
can bless us with rewards. You say, but isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit's work is to bring conviction in our lives. But you know what? Some of us are so hard-hearted, we can't hear the Holy Spirit talking to us. And so God sends along a person with skin on to say the thing that He's been saying to us for ages and we've not been listening. We all stand accountable before God, but we also need accountability to spiritual leaders. This is the one that is so problematic in our world. And yet in 1 Corinthians 16, 15 and 16, Paul writes and he says, He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, you know the house of Stephanus, that they have devoted themselves to ministry to the saints. I urge that you also be subject to such as these, and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. What's he saying? He's saying, you know what? God puts people in leadership to guard you and to watch over your life. Accountability is a problem for so many people. Why? Because we don't want somebody to tell us when we're wrong. But the problem arises when we think about giving an account to anyone on earth. We, we, we understand that perhaps we're going to do it to God, but to do it to a leader in the church just seems unchristian. And those who deal with this are predominantly those who are independently minded, which just means that they're stubborn and rebellious. All right, that was a nice way of putting it. I just thought I'd translate that into New Zealand language for you so you would understand it. But there's another group of the, the people who are pride of the, proud of their achievements. They self-made. They feel like they, they've won. And, and who are you that you would tell me what to do? And the third one, uh, the third category are those who've been burned by spiritual leaders in the past. And sadly, there has been a lot of abuse by spiritual leaders. And I'm not excusing that in any way to them. But what we need to understand is that because we had a bad experience doesn't mean we can give up on it. We actually need it. And you know, I, I just think of the strategy of the enemy. The enemy counterfeits everything God does. So, so you, you look at Moses throwing down his snake. What is, happens? The magicians throw down a snake. They're stuff and they become snakes. The enemy counterfeits what God does. Why? To discredit what is true. I love it because Moses' snake ate the other snake. So, oh, our God is greater. He is love that. I don't mess with my snake. Um, all right. Um, but the truth of the matter is, spiritual leaders sometimes cause devastation in the lives of people. And, and I, I weep over that. But this I know, they will stand before God and give an account. And God's not going to let them off. But it does mean that I need to learn to move on and to trust Him. And can I say this honestly? A leader only has the right, a Christian leader only has the right to bring correction in line with God's will. Not out of the book of imaginations. So if I come and tell you, you know, people of God, if you want to belong to Paya Baptist Church, you've got to bring the pastor uh, of Flat white every Sunday. That's out of the book of imagination. <laughs> or, you know, you need to give so that the pastor can have his own private jet. <sighs> A lot of abuse. Leadership needs to be based on the principles of God's will. So when a leader looks at me and says, you know, I think I have a concern in an area, then I want to know what biblical foundation there is for the concern they have. And then I need to check that that biblical fact is actually a fact and not distorted and manipulated to say what the person wants them to say. And you know what, I know that some people say, well I've been burned by a church leader in the past, I'll never trust anybody again. How many of you have ever had a problem with your iPhone? <laughs> 
<laughs> How many of you threw away your iPhone and said, I will never have another one? <laughs> I will never ever have another phone, let alone an iPhone. No, you realize that there are issues and we want. And that's so important in the church. Why should I be accountable to Christian leaders? In Hebrews 13 and 17 it says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. What should my reaction be? When a Christian leader speaks to you about issues or asks questions that are not comfortable, if they're not doing it idly or with just a view to getting something to gossip about, they're doing it because they care about you. And what you've got to learn to do is you've got to learn to look and see their attitude, hear what is happening, and periodically, Accept reproof that is offered. If you want to soar as an eagle, if you want to be above the level of mediocrity, then you've got to learn to be able to take criticism. We need to hear reproof from others. If you think it's hard receiving reproof from a Christian leader, you should try and be one who gives it. Have you ever just tried to help somebody in a normal way and you had a volcanic eruption of emotion and you were just trying to be helpful? But just multiply that by a hundred times to a Christian leader who goes along and says, you know, I'm really concerned the Bible says that you should love your wife. And love means to put her first and I just don't feel that you, you're doing that. Isn't that, isn't that fun? It's what we wake up in the morning and we just want to do. Yeah, Lord, I'm so glad I can do that today. Thank you for this privilege that I have. And you go along full of joy because now you've prayed about it, you've read, you've thought about it, you've got no attitude problem, you've, you, you've checked your attitude, you've, che you've checked everything. And you go along and say, I just want to say to you, you know, I just, I, I just have a concern about the way you're treating your wife. Because the Bible says you must love them. And that's it. That'll set off World War III. People, people throw their toys out of the car. People stamp their feet and roll their eyes. People have hissy fits, literally. Where they are so mad that they froth at the mouth. And you know what they do? They leave the church. And lovingly, good riddance. Mm -hmm. You know what? Because if you're not going to accept a correction based on God's principles and God's word, you're headed for disaster. And you will create a disaster for people around you. We've got to learn to receive reproof as well as to give it. Thirdly, we need to be accountable to one another. Now, this is a little more challenging, I think. In Romans 15, 14, it says, And concerning you, my brothers and sisters, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and are able also to admonish one another. Admonish one another. So it's not just for Christian leaders, but it should be for Christian brothers and sisters who care enough about us to be able to just draw alongside and share with us a concern that they have. In Galatians 6 and verse 1 it says, Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore such a person in the spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you are not tempted as well. So what we're saying is we need to do it with the right attitudes. But you know what? If somebody comes to me with a real right attitude and they want to talk to me about an issue they see in my life, I should be willing to listen. Does not mean I have to accept it. But I should listen. And I should be grateful that they cared enough to speak to me. And then what I do is I take it 
to the Lord and say, Father, this is what David said to me today. And I just want to hold it before you. And Father, is that true? Is that something I need to be aware of? You know what? 99% of the time, the Father will say yes. Because nobody criticizes us for fun unless they do. And there are a couple of them. Be aware of it. But you know what? We want the best for each other. And that means that we've got to learn to speak the truth to one another in love. In Proverbs 12 and 15, it says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a person who listens to advice is I am grateful to those through many years who've spoken into my life and brought correction when it needed to be brought. And you know, many of them were never Christian leaders. Many of them were just simple people who loved God and loved me enough to talk to me. You see, that's what the church is about. We're about guarding each other's blind spots. We're about looking after one another. We're about finishing this race together. It's not about how fast you run. It's about how fast the whole group can run. Not being accountable in times of stress can lead to disaster. You know, sometimes when we're not thinking right, we need somebody who loves us enough Tell us the truth when we say, I want to write a letter. <laughs> and they look at us and smile and say, maybe you should. <laughs> or they say, write the letter and put it on your mantelpiece and leave it there. You don't have mantelpieces anymore. Put it on the shelf and leave it there for the next month. Then take it down and reread it after a month. And if it's still what you want to say, then maybe it's a good thing. You know what? Most of us would tear the letter up. We need people we're accountable to in times of stress and disaster. Responsibility and authority without accountability can often lead to disaster. And, and your prosperity without accountability can sometimes lead to disaster too. When, when people come into a lot of money and they don't have wise counsel, they can waste it. I love this little statement. It says, a garden left to itself produces weeds. We need folk who care about us to help us pull the weeds in our lives. And so as we finish, why is there so little accountability? Our society values independence and self-sufficiency more than anything else. And it's come to the place where I am right, and you are wrong, all the time. I love the story of the, the, the mother who went to watch her son at his passing out parade in the military. He had done his basic training and had for three months been taught how to march in step with the rest. And as they stood and watched this huge band of soldiers marched across in front of them, and she turns to her husband and says, do you see everybody's out of step except our John? <laughs> it's that feeling like I'm right. Who are you? And it's a growing phenomenon, a rebellion against authority. We see it in, 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 in homes, a rebellion against the authority of parents. We sing it in society, a rebellion against the authority of the, of the state and, and of the police. And we're seeing it in the rebellion of people against God. And you know what? We need to understand God put accountability in place to keep us on. To keep us on track. And unhealthy independence gets set in concrete. When I do not allow people to speak to me about issues in my life, or discuss them with others. What happens is I become set in concrete and it's so much more difficult. Finally, unless we invite a, close, a few close friends to come alongside, most 
will continue to leave us alone. Accountability is invited. For church leaders, unfortunately, they have a responsibility to God. But you know what? I encourage you to find people, godly men and women, older than yourself, younger than yourself, the same age as yourself, that you sit down with on a regular basis and talk through stuff. Because accountability is the only way to fly. Why, why is Weight Watchers so successful? It's not their program. It's their accountability. In the early days of Weight Watchers, you had to go every week and get on the stable in front of everyone. And if you got on the scale and it was down, everybody would clap and cheer and celebrate. Man, you felt good. If it went up, <laughs> there'd be the odd boo or hiss. Or, but they didn't, you didn't even need that. Just knowing you're going to have to stand in front of people and stand on the scale. Keeps you on. Know it? Knowing that we've got to stand in the presence of God on the scale in front of everyone should keep us and lost. I met a gentleman some years ago when I was in Arriwa. He was well into his 60s. And for more years than he could remember, he struggled with poor mind. I, I was shocked. Because if I had to pick somebody, it wouldn't be you. For 60 years, it had been an issue. And he came and sat down with me one day and said, Would you hold me accountable? Would you just find me and ask me? Would you just check with me? And for those who are caught in pornography, there are some very good Christian helps. There's one, uh, an accountability checker that uh, monitors what sites you go on to on the internet. Because most times, pornography is done in the wee small hours when no one is Okay? And these just happen. And so I was his accountability for him. He'd struggled all those years. He was sincere in wanting to be free. But he'd never taken the step of getting an accountability for him. You know what? Within a couple of years, he was totally free. Totally free. Why? Because I'm a good accountability partner. No, I have nothing to do with him. But he just knew that I was going to phone him and say, so how's it been going? And he could lie to me, but he knew that he'd never win if he did that. And you know what? For some folk, it's not pornography. Or some, it's your daily devotion. And you just don't, you're just not consistent and you want it. Get an accountability partner who, who will check you. Not, not because they're trying to grade you, but because they're trying to encourage you to build a good habit. You know, in, in, in the area of daily devotions, get, get a spiritual diary. And, and keep a record of what you're thinking and what you're reading and what you're praying about in your spiritual diary. And, and once a week, take your spiritual diary to your accountability partner and let them see that you fiddled it in every day or five days of the week if that's what you're in. But you see, most of us are too proud to do that. But I'm telling you, the way to fly is through accountability. If you want to be a better follower of Jesus than you've ever been, then you need to have an accountability partner who will speak to you what God is speaking to them when you can't hear what He said. And so, my challenge, if we're going to soar, if we're going to rise above mediocrity, if we're going to be the people God wants us to be, then we need accountability. And we need to allow God to bring people into our lives who would assist us 
in what 